Oops. Well, a little bit of a bobble there as we got started. Very sorry about that, but I think that probably most of you were able to see uh, Chris, see and hear Chris Carberry, uh, help us to get started with this new session about the International Space Station and the role that it is playing and will continue to play in preparing us for uh, human spaceflight uh, well beyond low Earth orbit. Again, I am Matt Kaplan. I'm the host and producer of Planetary Radio for the Planetary Society, which explains that little pin right there. We do have an absolutely outstanding panel for you. And uh, because uh, we are a few minutes into our allotted time here, and there is so much more waiting for you across this last day of the uh, Humans to Mars Summit, I'm going to dive right in we're going to do this in the form of a general discussion. I don't think we're going to hear anything like a formal presentation, although uh, we have some absolutely outstanding experts who may have some things that they want to take a couple of minutes to explain to you. We're going to start uh, the introductions of that group with Julie Robinson. Julie is now at NASA HQ in DC, to, where she coordinates science and utilization strategies for all human spaceflight projects. But before that, for 13 years, she served as the International Space Station chief scientist out of JSC. And she represented all ISS research disciplines at the highest level in the program, provided information and recommendations to senior leaders inside the agencies and stakeholders on the outside. She also, because she was there so early, she was in on that transition. She oversaw the transition of the laboratory from the assembly period with just a handful of active investigations to full utilization, what we see today, hundreds of active investigations, keeping those astronauts very, very busy. Julie also received NASA's Outstanding Leadership Medal back in 2011. Julie Robinson, thanks for joining us today. And I think you're muted, Julie. Ah, it's great go. to be here. Good to have you. And we'll be right back with you after we meet uh, the other uh, of our terrific uh, panelists. Sharmi Watkins, MD, is the Assistant Director of Exploration in NASA's Human Health and Performance Directorate, also at JSC. She has served as a NASA flight surgeon, providing medical care to astronauts aboard the ISS, including Christina Koch, the current record holder, for the uh, sing longest single stay in space uh, among women. Charmy has also been lead scientist for the NASA Human Research Program's Exploration Medical Capability Element, she, and she's been a medical subject matter expert for NASA's commercial crew and exploration programs, and she was named a fellow of the Aerospace Medical Association. Charmy, welcome. I think it's Coke, not cock, isn't it? Didn't I get that it's wrong? It's Coke. <laughs> oh, I am so sorry to- Thank Christina. you for having me. It's great to be here. It is wonderful to have you on the panel as well. But there's more. Kelsey Young, a geologist and planetary scientist, is a NASA research scientist working on the integration of science into human spaceflight at the Goddard Space Flight Center. She is one of the NASA core team members on the geology training team for NASA astronauts, engineers, and managers. She has served as principal investigator or lead for- uh, more projects than we have time to mention, though I will say they include her work as science lead for NEMO, the NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operations Program that takes place 19 meters below the surface of the ocean off the Florida Keys. And uh, Kelsey, it was my pleasure to talk to one of the NEMO teams some years ago while they were doing their work down there. Uh, pretty exciting stuff, and we're excited to have you today as part of the panel. Thanks for having me. One person left to tell you about, and that is John Grunsfeld, otherwise known as the Hubble Repairman. He has been there and back five times, 58 days in space, and coincidentally, about 58 hours of extravehicular activity spread over eight spacewalks. The physicist later served as NASA's chief scientist. He left the agency to help run the Space Telescope Science Institute, and then came back as NASA Associate Administrator of the Science Mission Directorate. NASA awarded him its Distinguished Service Medal in 2002, and uh, John finally retired from the agency in 2016. John, welcome back. I mean, you're a past guest on Planetary Radio. It's good to see you. Was that a live long and prosper that you just flashed me there? And you're muted as well, John. 
Thanks. It's great to be with you. Live long and prosper. Yes, <laughs> definitely. LLAP. That came up in the last session as well. All right. I, I guess, Julie, I'd like to turn to you first as the person who may have the longest history of facilitating science on the ISS. And, you know, if you could say something about the role that it has already played and will continue to play in what is the topic of this session. I mean, yes, there's so much science underway on the ISS. We've talked about a lot of it on planetary radio, but looking specifically at preparing us for long duration spaceflight, how are we doing and what is the ISS role? Yeah, well, the, you know, the ISS was designed as a microgravity laboratory, a place where we could study what happens when you take gravity away and start looking at the effects of that on organisms, on physics, uh, we do other kinds of experiments there as well, such as uh, taking advantage of its position as a platform. But for the purposes of this particular discussion, right, the real value there is that we can use it as an analog for the transit to Mars, which we also believe will be a microgravity transit. What the ISS has done for us is we have essentially moved a generation forward in solving what we thought were the problems. Uh, that human physiology was going to face in that microgravity transit to Mars, we've essentially solved the set that you may, many people have mostly heard about. So people will say, oh, I've heard astronauts lose bone. Well, we now have a set of protocols developed on the ISS, so astronauts are not losing bone mass density. Uh, we've also discovered some things that you may not have heard about um, that are the unknown unknowns that ISS was designed to address. Things like vision impacts, or other kinds of challenges like that. So, um, so what we're what we're doing on ISS is first focused on that microgravity environment. But there are other hazards of human spaceflight that aren't as much of a perfect match, but that we can also study using ISS as a platform. Things like isolation and confinement, operating at a long distance from Earth, simulating communications delay, uh, looking at radiation impacts on. Uh, on physiology, both acute and chronic effects, even though the radiation isn't exactly the same, we still learn more there than we do in any other place. And then finally, looking at hostile closed environments, the microbiome, what happens as the crew interact with their life support systems, how we get those systems to be reliable. So all of those things we're learning on the ISS and the fact that we've had a long duration, we've had the last 10 years of full utilization and we have another 10 years ahead to really fine tune and test the systems that are going to be the systems we take to Mars. Charmy, that's a perfect lead to you as the, the other person on the panel who specifically looks at these biomedical health considerations. Um, do you concur with Julie? And what are the challenges that remain? I mean, do we have anything that we're still looking at the way that, you know, sailors looked at scurvy 400 years ago? Sure, we have many challenges still ahead of us. As Julie mentioned, ISS has given us this really amazing platform on which to learn, and we have learned a lot. Um, Julie also alluded to the five kind of hazards to human health that we encounter in spaceflight. And so to recap some of those, uh, altered gravity is one of them, closed environment, the radiation environment, isolation and confinement and distance from Earth. And we have all of those at a measure when we're on ISS, and we'll have them even more so as we go to journey to Mars. So definitely still stuff to learn. Um, she also alluded to some of the vision changes we've seen. That was, I think, a recent find that was a surprise to us. You know, um, when you think about loading of the body and removing that loading, you can figure out from a physiology standpoint that there will be some change to homeostasis and that your body will need to necessarily adapt. The visual system, it wasn't as obvious to us that that would be something we could see in spaceflight. And so, we're always learning. I think we're going to encounter new challenges as we go forward. But the great thing is, I think at the fundamental level, physiologically, we've learned a lot on ISS that we can carry forward. I'm so glad that you brought up that vision challenge because, I mean, as you said, apparently that was unexpected. Uh, where uh, the vision actually changes, it, do we now know whether those effects are always temporary or there may be some lingering effects, even permanent? And are there countermeasures that are being talked about? I'm, I wasn't going to get this specific so early, but I'm glad you brought it up. Sure. Yes, we have learned quite a bit. And for most people, those are temporary changes to vision. Um, there are some structural changes, though, that we can see within the eye itself that persist for time. 
Um, again, we haven't been seeing these cases for very long, so we don't know if they're going to last years or forever, but there are some structural changes that can last quite a long time. The great news is that we have folks who have flown and they come back and, and their vision recovers and the structural changes are something that we're following and we're learning about. And then definitely the human research program has invested a lot in looking at both the mechanism that's causing this and potential countermeasures. So we're making great strides and I think we will continue to do that using ISS so that we're ready for Mars. Well, there are a lot of other specifics there that maybe we'll have time to get to in this too short hour. But John, I want to go to you. And I bet the rest of the panel, like me, envies you because you actually got to face some of these challenges eight, well, five different times. Um, tell us, um, do you also see the progress that has been made um, on ISS and the, what we need to continue to do using that very valuable platform and perhaps other platforms, I'm thinking of the gateway. And of course, uh, when we put uh, boots back on the moon, how that's gonna help us prepare to get humans to Mars. Well, I certainly agree with, with Julie and Charmy that we've made enormous progress. And in particular, you know, in, in the muscle atrophy and the bone loss, you know, that was seen as, as a big impediment to going to Mars. Uh, and remarkably, uh, as, as both Julie and Charmy referred to, the human body is incredibly adaptable. Uh, and, you know, there are two keys to solving the bone and muscle problem. And, and this is, you know, a secret that NASA has kept under wraps. And I just can't, you know, not talk about it anymore because it's just too important. Diet and exercise. Uh, and, that, and seriously, that's really what solved our problems. And you talked about scurvy. Uh, and, you know, it really has specific relevance in that during the MIR program, uh, the MIR space station program, where we had, you know, a number of NASA astronauts participating, uh, you know, astronauts were were deprived of vitamin D, which is a critical, it's it's more than a vitamin, it's really more of, you know, a major part of human physiology uh, that affects the immune system in addition to, to bone and muscle. But uh, we discovered, hey, you really need vitamin D in space because there's no sunlight inside of a can uh, that we get. Uh, and we had to supplement that. But more importantly is the exercise uh, protocols that, you know, on earth, we stay healthy because we exercise, our bones uh, get stressed and that keeps them strong. Uh, obviously, you know, doing exercise helps our muscles and we have to do the same in space. And so the exercise protocols that have been developed, and yes, it, it may be, uh, you know, a bunch of time on orbit, a couple hours a day, um, but it does a number of things. One, you know, exercise helps keep the bones and muscles strong. Uh, it also helps the immune system. And it also is really good for, you know, for your brain uh, to, to keep you happy. And, and that has an effect on your overall health. Um, so, so that's been a major breakthrough. Now, some of the more subtle things, uh, such as the vision changes, you know, actually, we started seeing that uh, when we started flying the space shuttle, and we had lots of people flying, that there was an acute, a short term vision change, and people would come back and they'd say, oh, it's, it's, it's done. And we interpreted that uh, as just pressure on, on the eyes. Um, but in the long duration flights, as Charmy referred to, we've been seeing uh, you know, somewhat more subtle effects um, having to do with you know, maybe a structural change, but maybe something else uh, you know, unrelated just to the fluid shift uh, that could be more significant. And there have been some astronauts who have come back and the recovery is either extremely long or, or perhaps not at all. So there are some mysteries still out there, uh, you know, as far as human health. But, you know, overall, the human system is shown to be incredibly adaptable. But your, uh, your broader question, though, is, you know, how are we doing? And here we are <clears throat> 10 years on in, in the occupation of the space station. And I think we're doing well, but we could be doing so much better. Uh, you know, this is our orbital laboratory, and and really, with the exception of radiation, the human body can't tell the difference between the free fall environment of the International Space Station. You know, gravity is still there. It's just that we're falling all the time, so it's microgravity. But we can't tell the difference between that and a trip to Mars other than radiation. And so this is our huge opportunity. You know, we spend, you know, something like $4 million a day operating the space station. You know, we need to, I think, 
be much more aggressive if we want the station uh, to, to give us the answers while it's still up there and operating. And as Julie said, you know, we should be able to operate it, you know, for another 10 years. This is our big chance. We have a great space station uh, and we should be using it more aggressively. I think if you were to ask, uh, and, and Matt, you talk to people all the time, you know, ask the average person on the street or even other astronauts and say, do you think the International Space Station looks like a Mars mission? I think most people would say no. They'd say it's a wonderful microgravity laboratory and we're doing some research including you know the human physiology which we i wouldn't say we get for free it's a lot of work but we get that by having humans in space but i think we should be more aggressive there my mind is bursting with more biomedical uh, aspects to this discussion uh but there are so many other things that the iss can be helping us to do kelsey i have saved you for now because you kind of come at this from a different angle and that is Yes, we have to keep the astronauts healthy and in good shape, diet and exercise, who'd have thought? Um, but once they get to where they're going, whether it's the moon or let's hope Mars before too long, they're going to be doing science. They're going to have to get a lot of work done and they're going to need tools to do that. How are we making progress on the ISS as we prepare them for doing that kind of work? And I, I think in, in part of this is how really great we've good begotten at at repairing the ISS and upgrading it, like putting in the new batteries that uh, that work that was just completed a few weeks ago. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the physiology touches on the ability to do geoscience and, and geological investigations as well, because when the crews land on Mars after that really long transit time, the activities they're going to be expected to do include conducting extravehicular activities designed to collect samples. They'll be traveling distances away from the lander, potentially with the assistance of, of a rover, depending on what that architecture looks like. So the physical activities they're going to be conducting when they land, um, you know, are going to be to be strenuous. Um, so understanding exactly what, you know, Julie, Charmy and John have talked about with with how that human body is going to react when they land on the surface of Mars and, and are asked to do geologic tasks um, are going to be is going to be really critical to understand. So all these issues, um, while they're mostly in the physiology realm, really do touch our ability to do, you know, the physical sciences on the surface. Um, you know, ISS can be a really useful platform in many ways for pre preparing to do geology on Mars. Uh, crew training is a big one. Uh, we train astronauts now to be scientists, to be the scientist proxies in space. Um, scientists are taking pictures of Earth that are teaching scientists about active surface processes. They're taking pictures of big storm systems that, that help us kind of plot their trajectories and understand how they move over, over the Earth's surface. Um, and in the same way, astronauts will be those scientists proxies on the surface of Mars as well. Um, so when we're training crews for station uh, to understand how to do science in space, uh, it's, you know, the same processes and methodologies work for Mars exploration as well. And in fact, the last three astronaut classes we've trained, um, you know, we train in, in Earth observations and geography and how to take really good pictures that are useful to science, to scientists back on Earth. Um, but we also teach them about lunar science, Martian science, about the active missions that NASA has across our entire solar system. Um, so we're training astronauts to be good scientists across the solar system. And of course, Mars as the ultimate destination is, is a big part of that. So ISS can be a really useful training ground for, for a lot of ways, uh, physiology included. John, this just and I have to jump in and say, many astronauts are scientists. Uh, I'm an astrophysicist. Uh, and planetary scientists, and, and Kelsey knows that, and we've had many scientists in space. So it's not just a proxy. We should be sending scientists and, and certain kinds of engineers and, and medical doctors uh, out into space, which is what we do. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> and I'm thinking of Harrison Schmidt, the, the one scientist who got to walk on the moon, and thank goodness things have changed. John, it occurred to me as Kelsey was talking about that, to ask you whether over the course of your missions, you saw an evolution in the tools you used and the protocols that you were given to work with for getting work done that, that also might be moving us closer to deep space. Well, absolutely. Um, and, and Kelsey mentioned doing spacewalks on the surface of Mars, uh, which anytime you go out on Mars, you're gonna need a spacesuit. Um, we are still using the spacesuits from the shuttle program on the International Space Station. I think there's about 10 left. So that's an example where uh, we could really use the International Space Station to try new spacesuits. My expectation, uh, you know, way back when I was chief scientist is by now we'd have tested two or three different types of designs uh, for spacesuits, but also tools. Uh, for the Hubble Space Telescope, 
you know, during training, we developed lots of new tools to do the upgrades and, and repairs that we did because often they weren't, the, the telescope wasn't designed to be fixed and we had to invent new tools. And so the kind of things that uh, Kelsey does in the field work with astronauts, with engineers, uh, is to look at, you know, what kind of tools should we have? And, and we're not just talking about, you know, a better hammer, better rock hammer. In some cases, in most cases, we're talking about, you know, very high tech analytical tools. When we go to Mars, we're going to want to do, uh, you know, X-ray computer tomography in a little handheld unit to be able to look inside of rocks, to be able to see what their structure and composition is. And those kind of tools for field work, especially on a, another planetary surface, are just being invented now. And so that's another example where, you know, the combination John, of you just froze. Light. We might have a... Oh. Uh, you got me? There. Is everybody back? John, I lost you for a moment there, okay. but maybe it was just on my oh. end. Sorry about sure. that. We, well, we heard you talking anyway, about uh, high-end yeah. analysis tools. Lots of new tools. And it's it's a little broader where you'll have an... Ast hopefully, we'll have an astronaut on Mars, a woman operating a tool on Mars to look inside of the rocks, but we're gonna to wanna to send that data back where we have supercomputers on Earth to synthesize it and work with a much broader scientific community to understand what we're seeing. And exercising all those aspects is something that we can do on ISS. I, I wanna add one more thing about the International Space Station, which is you know, if we have uh, women and men on the station doing six month or eight month cruises, uh, expeditions, their bodies think they went to Mars. At the end of their mission, they get to come back to a planetary surface where we can exercise all these protocols and experiments uh, as if they were on Mars. We can do that today. We do it a little bit, but I think we need to work on that to exercise those tools. We can pretend we're on Mars here on planet Earth. You know, we have two great resources, the International Space Station and planet Earth to learn about how to explore Mars. Interesting. Julie, I think well, are you in there, to? if there I could just are. jump in briefly, right, because we're 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 moving out on exactly those kind of things. So I want to be sure that people don't have the misimpression that NASA is not doing these things. So, for example, um, we've been doing extensive studies of crew performance after six months and one year missions. We're planning on doing additional one year missions, and those include a significant surface component. Um, we've been doing that from the Soyuz landings, and we will be doing that from the Boeing landings in the desert once we have uh, those CST-100 missions starting up. So those plans are in place. And uh, in addition to that, we are doing additional studies of things like autonomous systems. So, for example, last summer, uh, we looked at how well the crew could diagnose using on-orbit tools like ultrasounds and so forth without any ground support. Could they diagnose a major medical event? And could they actually do the right things if that had been an event and they couldn't talk to the ground? Could they do the right things? So we're gradually uh, developing those sorts of systems in a way that's very Mars forward and proving that they work well in orbit. The other thing we're doing is starting to work with some of the tools that you would need to do planetary surface activities and validate those on Mars. Things like being able to sequence microbes and document what those are, which has applications both for human health, as well as for environmental life support and for planetary protection. So as we put all of those things together, we can do a lot on ISS today. Then we have those same systems ready to test in integrated missions in extended Artemis missions eventually, where people could live say um, in uh, lunar orbit for a period of time, then go to the surface. We can test their performance there with Mars-like systems and then test their recovery and their return. So those integrated missions become our final validation that we're really ready to send humans to Mars. And that's the kind of strategy that we've been working over the last several years. I wanna go on to life support considerations in a moment, but we are, believe it or not, already about halfway through our allotted time here in the 2020 Humans to Mars Summit. Um, and I, I do want to mention to our participants, anybody who is, has joined us today and is enjoying this session with us, uh, you can submit your questions for this terrific panel, and they will show up here, and I will filter through those. We'll get to as many of them as we can. At the moment, uh, we have plenty of room for uh, more of those questions. All right, life support. Uh, Julie, maybe I'll stick with you for this. I am amazed at the progress that has been made. I, I had a guest on Planetary Radio not long ago who was talking about the tremendous progress made just in the recovery of water 
which is going to be critical for a trip to Mars, unless we're going to bring, you know, a million gallons along with us uh, and then distill more when we get there. Is that a good example of where the ISS is is proving as a good test bed that we're going to be able to keep humans in great shape for the, what, three years it's going to take to go there and back? Yeah, I think of sort of three figures of merit for what we've accomplished with life support on ISS. The first is the recovery ability. You know, how well are we recovering water? How well are we are, are we scrubbing CO2? Kind of what's our efficiency? The second is understanding our systems and their reliability enough that we can predict exactly how many new filters, how many consumables we need to support those. You know, if we had taken what we knew about life support the, when we started ISS and tried to go to Mars with that, we would have run out of supplies halfway there. So we need that knowledge of the reliability and the resupply. But the third area where we've really made huge improvements in this current generation of life support equipment that we're just starting to test on ISS is in making them small and lightweight so that they're really Mars ready. They don't take the mass and the volume. These are not things that are the size of refrigerators anymore. They're small packages. And that is also hugely important for closing the loop and being ready to send people to Mars. Anybody else want to get in on this, this uh, consideration of life support? Are we there? Could we, with the technology that exists now, get to Mars and back? Or do we need to do a lot more work on the ISS and the moon and the gateway? Well, you know, I think Julie really hit the nail on the head uh, with, uh, you know, the talking about closing the system, uh, which means, you know, not having to bring a lot of consumables uh, and making things, you know, lighter weight, more reliable. And it really comes under the rubric of logistics. And that applies, you know, to life support, food systems, tools, everything. You know, once we leave, you know, from Earth on our way to Mars, you know, once you're a couple of weeks out, you know, that's it. You know, there's no, you know, there's no going to the grocery store to pick up a few more things or going to the hardware store to get, you know, some extra filters. I know you, you're pretty much on your own. Now, there could be resupply and other things in the logistics model. Um, mm. But the ISS really provides us this opportunity to test out, uh, as Julie said, some new life support systems, other new systems. And, uh, you know, one of the big areas that uh, is being researched, but I think not, not enough is being done, is, is food systems, which is part of that life support. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, for, for some folks, it's unfortunate that we have to eat. Um, you know, Kelsey was doing that last night and had a little incident, you know, which, uh, you know, she'll, she'll recover. Good luck, uh, Kelsey. I'm glad, glad you got the help you needed. Um, you probably had the first aid uh, response correct from the start, but, you uh, at any rate, uh, food systems, you know, the human is part of the environmental and life support system. And so what we eat can actually affect what our requirements are for CO2 scrubbing. We learned that on the Hubble mission. That was our, in an emergency rescue case, our limit was carbon dioxide scrubbing out of the cabin atmosphere. And we learned that we could change our diet to minimize or reduce slightly the CO2 production. Now, it wasn't a big deal. It gave us an extra day on orbit you know, before we'd perish if we were in that situation. But we need to look at all of the aspects of the human in the loop with the life support system and, and research is being done on ISS in that direction. Um, but food is a, is a big deal for people and it's something, we, you know, the nutri space nutrition we should work on as well as the hardware. And we have a lot of opportunities on ISS to do that. Kelsey, glad to see that you're uh, recovering well. Uh, Sharmi, bad things obviously happen to good people. How are we going to handle emergencies? Uh, the example that I gave you in a, a conversation we had a few days ago, you know, I was fascinated. I had a guest on the show a while back who talked about the need for dental care on a mission to Mars. What happens if you get a toothache and somebody's got to give you a filling? I mean, that's the kind of thing we have to be prepared right. for, right? Exactly. So on ISS, as you know, flight surgeons provide medical care remotely for our crew members, but we also have had the fortune of having many physician astronauts. And when they are in place or when other trained astronauts are in place, we use them as our hands and our eyes and our ears. Um, so we've gotten very good at doing remote medicine. And that's been the model we followed for the last many years. As we start to get ready to go to Mars, that model has to change. 
um, with comm delay and with resupply concerns, et cetera, we're gonna need that crew to function autonomously. And that goes to every aspect of the mission, including medical care. So if we happen to be at a point in transit where we didn't have good communication, or perhaps we had a communication glitch of some sort, we would need the crew to be able to respond to those medical emergencies. And the way that we get ready for that is like Kelsey says, training. We train the crews. The crews are exceptional at learning new skills. And so we basically train them to be you know, crew medical officers. And we will rely heavily on those that do have a background in the life sciences or happen to be physicians to help us with this. So we would expect them to jump to action and function the way that any medical professional would to address the issue and communicate to the ground when time and bandwidth are available. So that's the model we're moving toward and we're training our crews to start taking that authority now. As Julie mentioned, we have plans in place to continue to grow that effort. But to get to your question about dentistry, it's definitely an area we've talked about. And, uh, you know, there's the phrase that, you know, a toothache is a minor you know, incident to somebody who doesn't have the toothache, but it's the person with the toothache. It's kind of all that's going on in their world at the moment. And so we've worked with a dentist to understand what are the conditions that could occur. Uh, again, prevention and training. So we, our crew members have excellent dental care on the ground, but right now that dental care really just needs to carry them for the duration of the mission which has been on average about six months. And we all know that, you know, the dentists ask us to come in about every six months to get our teeth cleaned and checked. As we start to stretch that to a year, and as we start to stretch that beyond a year, we're gonna ask our crew medical officers to get involved, right? So one of their roles might be dental hygienist. We might use things like fluoride application, like we do in children, hmm. you know, to help them prevent cavities between visits. Well, you know, our crew members are going to be excellent about brushing their teeth, but it's going to be a long spell between visits. And so there are things we can do from a prevention standpoint. And then in those rare cases where our prevention strategies have failed, we will expect that those crew members can walk through procedures. They can, you know, I think a lot of us have learned to do uh, home improvement with YouTube. So they can have just-in-time training, review what it is they need to do, ask questions of dentists on the ground, and then go ahead and perform that procedure for their crewmate. So things like cavities that need to be filled, we could do that. If you had a filling that has come loose, we could re-glue it. Those are the types of things that we will be prepared to handle, but will lean very heavily on prevention and screening. I wonder if anybody has done a YouTube video uh, so far, uh, at-home appendectomy, do it yourself. Um, well, Matt, let me just jump in for a moment because what, what Charmaine said is exactly right. And you know, I also go on, on these long duration high altitude mountaineering expeditions. And, and one of the things after uh, I was training for the International Space Station, I was the crew medical officer for my expedition. And we did a lot of dental training, uh, which was really quite useful. And I think every crew member who will go to Mars should be trained at what we call the wilderness emergency medical technician level. Mm. And it's not that hard to do. It's, it's typically, you know, about a month of intensive training. And as part of that crew medical officer training, we volunteered at hospitals uh, and we worked, one of the units was, was the dental. Uh, and so I learned how to replace fillings, how to re put caps back on, how to pull teeth, how to give Novocaine injections, lidocaine injections. And, uh, you know, it was interesting training. And uh, at the time my daughter was losing her baby teeth. And so I offered her five bucks to let me go into the dentist with her, uh, the NASA dentist, and I pulled those teeth out. Uh, and so she made about 10 or 15 bucks that way. Um, and so I had some practical experience, but on, on real expeditions, I've actually had to replace a cap once and, uh, and put in a temporary filling on a long duration mountaineering expedition. Uh, and so that training is, I think, what astronauts will have. But it won't just be dentistry. Obviously, it will be the full complement of medical training. And and as Charmy said, you know, we'll probably review videos and we'll have some interaction, uh, long, you know, long distance interaction with the time delays uh, with with doctors on the ground to give us the best protocols. We have questions coming in. I'm glad to say it was uh, there was kind of a. Uh, a, a wasteland there for a little bit, but they're coming in now and I want to get to them fairly quickly because we are going to be running out of time soon. But uh, Shari, you mentioned just in passing and John, once again, talked about the latency, the communication delay, the asynchronous nature of communication, the closer you get to Mars. Julie, is that also something that ISS or perhaps other work by NASA is, is preparing us for? And 
How much of a challenge do you think it's going to be? Yeah, so communication delay is a really interesting challenge. It's one that um, we've got some really talented people, for example, at the Jet Propulsion Lab that have been working Mars missions with comm delay and building capability for doing that kind of work from a mission operations perspective. We also have the ability to simulate it on ISS, and we have done a series of tests occasionally over the past five years where we actually simulated that comm delay. We have the capability to do that more in the future. And the key is to make sure if you can simulate it on the ground, you should not be wasting time on ISS doing it. So oftentimes we do a lot of testing on the ground first. NEMO certainly has tested comm delay as well. But that capability in ISS is an important feature to have us as we do some of these medical simulations and get confident that we know how to operate for the humans, not just for robotic systems, but we know how to operate with humans in the loop in those comm delay environments. So that's a, a, a really important role that I think the ISS can play. John, I know you have thoughts about this, but Kelsey, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean the communications delay. Obviously, when you're dealing with a you know a medical crisis or something other you know something like that that requires really quick thinking and quick action, um, the the training is obviously critical because you won't have the time to wait for a reply from Earth. Um, you have different kind of scales of looking at the issue of that of that latency on the the transit out to Mars and when the crew is sitting in the habitat or the lander on the surface of Mars, you have a little bit more time, barring any emergency situations, to send the questions or the comments back to Earth and wait for a reply. You know, EVA is this weird middle ground where you have a four, six, eight hour EVA where you're going to be doing science and reacting and making decisions on the couple hour time scale where that 15, 20, 30 minute latency really does become a problem. Uh, the same way that Sharmi talked about the, you know, the medical officers in spaceflight now, the same will be true for doing science on the surface of Mars. We're going to have those crew members, hopefully some of them are scientists or geologists, in their own right, but those that that didn't come into the office with that skill set will be trained, will be highly trained to be able to do that science on the surface of Mars. But they'll still have the support as well from mission control like we're used to, um, however, with obviously that latency built in. So that choreography of understanding how to send questions and comments and images when bandwidth permits and um, sensitive science data that John mentioned earlier from these really intricate um, spectrometers and tools that we're building for the surface of, of the moon and Mars, um, it, it really does benefit from interaction, even on a delayed time scale from science teams back on Earth who can help take those data, take those images, take those observations, and fit them into the broader context of those big picture science questions we're gonna be answering on the surface of Mars. Um, but being able to operate on that four, six, eight hour time frame within one EVA with that latency built in um, really does take some really intricate choreography and a lot of practice. Um, so missions like NEMO, which is the underwater analog project that we mentioned earlier, um, are really great opportunities to test that choreography and build not only a trained crew cadre, but also the mission support personnel that will be needed needing to be used to operating with those latencies. So we as science teams and, and with our flight operations counterparts are, are hard at work understanding exactly what that latency is going to mean for answering science questions and being able to react to that, you know, sensitive instrument data that's going to be coming back, that's going to be critical to identifying, you know, signs of life on Mars and answering these really big picture driving science questions that are one of the main drivers for pushing us to Mars in the first place. Um, so it is a very challenging dance, having per participated in several missions like that in the past, where I'm sitting, um, you know, next to the CAPCOM in Mission Control, who's being required to, you know, funnel sampling priorities to a crew that has this 30-minute round trip communications delay on, you know, on the surface of Mars, aka the, the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, um, is really critical practice, again, not just for the, the crews, the astronauts themselves, but for all of us who are building the tools that astronauts are going to need, and for the science teams that are building the instruments and the sensors right now that astronauts are going to be deploying on Mars. That practice, that choreography is a, is a tight dance, and uh, we're, we're hard at work on it now, and ISS is a great platform to do that, like Julie said, as our analog projects on Earth like NEMO. John, very briefly, do you worry about this? Uh, actually, I don't worry about this. It is something, as Kelsey said, that we have to work the choreography. But you know, if you look at the way the world works today, we are all communicating asynchronously with random time delays from minutes to days. You know, it's it's texting, it's Instagram. You know, this is how people are living today, and scientists are working this way too. Uh, and you know, all you have to do is is look at how we're doing webinars now and, and imagine a scientist in, an, in a spacesuit, you know, is picking up the rock and, and looks at it 
and says Eureka, and then you know the com cuts out, and then it's 30 minutes later that the scientists on Earth get that, and they see the Eureka, and they think, oh my gosh, what is it? And then the com cuts out. Uh, you know that's going to be very frustrating. So I think the real frustration is not so much going to be with the astronauts on site. Uh, even in emergencies, because as everyone has said, they're going to have to be trained to respond as we do now uh, on, on orbit on the International Space Station. But, you know, the world is working towards this asynchronous communication uh, anyway. So I think I think we're all going to be accustomed to it by the time we get to Mars. With 15 minutes left, roughly, let's get to some of these questions that are uh, piling up in the chat window over here. And I'm going to try and consolidate some of these and filter them a bit. We're getting a lot of questions about the psychological, emotional, um, sociological considerations and how ISS can help us to learn to deal with those. Here's an example from Maya Sukup. What are your thoughts on sending a trained psychologist counselor as an astronaut to help the crew manage their mental health? and psychological effects that could occur with extended deep space travel. You know, a lot of people talk about, okay, so far we've never gotten far away from, uh, far enough away from Earth to it being reduced to a dot, which it certainly will be for Mars. Um, Julie, this is obviously a consideration. Well, we definitely are learning a lot from ISS as an analog for Mars transit, including in the areas of uh, behavioral health and performance. And we've linked our experiments on ISS to our use of facilities like the HERA facility on the ground and the NEK facility in Russia. And we, we connect those missions together so that we're developing best practices. I think that in the same way that modern medicine now includes in all physicians training to be uh, a good counselor training in behavioral health and so forth. We're going to see that across all of our crew members. You know, what we think of as team training, say from the Apollo era, what we're thinking about as team training today in putting good teams together from a behavioral and psychological perspective has transformed. And that's really going to inform the way that we put together the, that first team of astronauts that go to Mars as well. Anyone else want to get in on this? Charmy? Sure, I think it's an excellent question and it's one that we have been thinking about. Julie mentioned, you know, the idea of a general practitioner having some of those requisite skills. And as we look to the future, we need somebody with a very broad skill set. We need somebody who can handle, you know, the run of the mill uh, dermatology conditions and also the stresses of being in an isolated environment. I think all of us have had a taste of that over the past several months and you know that it can be quite disruptive to day-to-day -day life. And so we anticipate that crew members are gonna have challenges. They're gonna be away from their families, away from some of their, their network, but our teams have done a great job, I think, learning with ISS, how we can provide for some of those things, how we have phone calls with families and video conferences with families, um, send up some of their favorite items. And so we'll be learning those lessons anew as we go to Mars, but we're gonna leverage heavily what we've done and uh, as Julie was mentioning, we do have several extended duration analog facilities in which to learn. And we can learn for those who um, winter over in the Antarctic, for example, and figure out what coping mechanisms do they have available? How are they working? And we have a whole behavioral health team that's learning those lessons and doing the research to get us ready. I just want to give anybody else who wants to uh, a chance to get in on this. Well, you know, if you look at the history of exploration, you know, people thrive when they have a high performance challenge ahead of them. And so I think the first few crews that go to Mars, uh, you know, first of all, we do expedition behavior training. We use the National Outdoor Leadership School as <clears throat> using the outdoors with real risks and, and situations to help train crews before they go to their International Space Station missions. But this idea of an expedition with a challenge <clears throat> really, uh, helps human psychology. Um, it's So going to Mars, I think, is going to be less of a challenge than after the mission on the surface when you have this very long transit back. I think that's going to be the most stressful. But as, as you know, Sharmi says, you know, we're going to be training people, every crew member, to a certain level of medical standard um, for, for expertise, and that has to include the human and behavioral health. Uh, for us to be successful. And I think, you know, the International Space Station is a great opportunity to learn that. 
And I have to apologize to you, our panelists, and to the everyone else who's participating in this session. I, for some reason, got the idea that we had a full hour, and I am reminded now that we actually only had a 50-minute session, and we are at that point now. But I'm hoping that we can get the indulgence of the uh, folks at Explore Mars and give each of you a chance to get in a last couple of words here. Um, if you have some final thoughts that you, that you can keep very brief. Uh, Kelsey, let me go to you first, and I think I will leave you with this question. Are we well on the way to being prepared to make that long mission to Mars, thanks to work underway on the ISS, and that is still ahead of us as we head for the moon? Uh, yeah, the answer from my perspective, especially putting my you know geologist and planetary science hat on, is absolutely uh, work on the ISS and work in the analogs, preparing astronauts to go to both ISS and one day to Mars. Um, you know, has really created a you know a, a common language among the engineers, the flight controllers, the astronauts, the scientists, the mission control personnel who are all going to be involved and. We're learning a lot of lessons on designing EVA tools, like sampling tools and, you know, in-situ instruments that astronauts are going to be using and, and how to, you know, train a crew that perhaps hopefully will include scientists, but even if not, include a well-trained crew who is ready and willing to, you know, do science on the surface of Mars. So again, speaking just from the, you know, planetary science perspective, you know, I'm, I'm incredibly optimistic. We've made a ton of progress with International Space Station and analog missions, and I'm just, you know, really excited to see all the science and the samples that the astronauts are going to bring back from Mars. John, same question to you. Are we getting there? I think we are getting there. I think uh, there's there's more emphasis we can put on using the ISS as while we have it, uh, and you know I, I'm I'm confident that you know NASA is working in that direction. Uh, I'd I'd like to see us to get to a point where you know the average person on the street uh, knows who the astronauts are who are on board and says you know yeah it looks like a Mars expedition to us. Nice. Sharmi, you're up next. Do you see a... Yes, I absolutely think we're getting there. We're learning so much about human physiology. I think we learn something new every day. Um, we have excellent countermeasures that are being developed and we continue to improve on those things. So I think we know where we have risk and where we need to focus our efforts to be ready for Mars, but we're well on our way. Julie, you'll get the last word. Well, let me just say that not only are we well on our way, but we're in a uniquely powerful position right now with 10 years perhaps of ISS to kind of pin down the things that we now know we need to solve and having lunar surface activities and those early missions on the moon, putting those things together is absolutely the critical path for being ready to be go for Mars. Thank you all. There is so much more I would have loved to have talked to you about. We didn't even get to talk much about the radiation challenge. Another day, I hope, and I hope to see all of you in person next year when uh, Humans to Mars, uh, the summit, moves from this virtual platform. Let's hope back to seeing each other in person. I am Matt Kaplan of the Planetary Society and Planetary Radio. Glad that you could join us, and I hope you'll be sticking around for the rest of this great last day of the Humans to Mars Summit.